Welcome back to the Wealth Actually podcast, the show that features artists, entrepreneurs, experts, and commentators that will give you the right knowledge, planning, and guidance so you can preserve your assets and enjoy your wealth. Learn more and subscribe today at wealthactually.com. And now, here's your host, Fraser Rice. Welcome back to the Wealth Actually podcast. I'm Fraser Rice. The world of property and casualty insurance is undergoing a significant business model change. Emerging risks to high net worth clients include the impacts of COVID and climate change to their businesses and assets. Additionally, there are two relatively new frontiers of risk, cybersecurity and social media. These lightly understood risks can pose a threat to clients' assets, businesses, and reputations. Helping us learn about the shifting landscape of personal risk is Ahmet Bidav. Ahmet is an insurance executive specializing in the high net worth space. His company, Lux STR, specializes in insuring the personal and commercial assets of successful families and individuals across the United States. Welcome aboard, Ahmet. Thank you, Fraser. In the world of property and casualty insurance, there's a lot going on, but take us through your background a little bit, in particular, your acting career. You have a little foray into that, which I always think is interesting, and how you developed your expertise. I joined a company called Pure Insurance back in 2016. Pure specialized in high net worth personal lines, so homes above $1 million in value, collectibles, yachts, cars, insuring the toys we all like to use, I suppose. The underwriter, although being like a technical kind of role, was also one I think that had some business development requirements. And I've always been shy. Last time we spoke, I sort of said the phrase shy extrovert. I enjoy talking with people, but it's just sort of getting to that point. And then around that time, I thought, well, maybe I'll benefit from like an improv class or something. There were none at the time. And so I joined like acting 101 kind of thing. I had never done it before in my life. It turned out I was quite good at it. <laughs> and this is for the people listening who probably can't see me, I'm what they would call ethnically ambiguous, which is also a commercially viable thing in that world these days. So for while working at Pure, I did some professional acting work on the side. I was represented by a group called TTA Agency in New York, mostly small things. I did a Oatly oat milk commercial. That was probably the zenith of my short-lived career. <laughs> I was an underwriter for Westchester agents, New York City agents at Pure until 2019. So again, underwriting home, auto, the works. Around that time, I got tapped into a new role for sort of alternate product development. I think it was sort of taking a look at emerging trends and both within our enforced clientele, but also prospective clients looking at whether it was a viable option for us to maybe develop a product in that space. So for example, we looked at private aviation quite a bit. We looked at kidnap and ransom, travel and medical, back, those kind of things. So take us through what that means when you're developing a product. You have to go in and when you underwrite, you're sort of understanding the probabilities of bad things happening and how much you should charge and run that through a variety of spreadsheets, I'm sure, to make sure that if you insure a certain thing, it doesn't take the company down. For example, one thing was owner operators of small jets. So these were your people who were pure clients or prospective clients, but who were also licensed pilots and they probably owned their own aircraft. Something, hey, is it an easy value add to our current clients? So we kind of had to look at what was the immediate value of this today? If we launched it today, how many clients can we sell to today in force? The FAA data, a lot of this stuff is public. You just kind of cross-reference it with your enforced clientele and you get an idea of who owns what, what their consumer profile looks like. You also want to look at the industry itself. Aviation industry, it's a very hard market as they call it. If had a lot of profitability issues. You've had withdrawals of major carriers and reinsurers, in some cases like triple digit rate increases. So do we want to be in this space or maybe how can we get comfortable if we did want to be in it? And then you kind of work through there. With aviation, the problem is the losses were far and few, but when they happened, they were pretty significant. You're in New York, I'm in New York, and Salino and Barnes was postered all over town. And now it's only one partner. The other one was flying, he's an owner-operator himself, 
was flying, I think, from New York to Buffalo and had a crash. And the Kobe Bryant thing has been another. Everybody's sort of following that pretty closely just to see. We all know, how, in theory, your the contract is supposed to read, but we're just trying to see like how that actually plays out. I guess the rarer the event, the less intelligent we can kind of be about it, the less we know about frequency. And so when that's the case, you just kind of have to pull money off the table. So that was one where it was sort of looking at it. You look at industry profit, industry growth. You look at, is the perception of risk greater than the risk itself? Because <laughs> that's how an insurance carrier makes money. Again, I'll focus on aviation. Like in 2001, after 9-11, you kind of have like this trauma, psychological trauma, and you saw a hardening of the market then. So a lot of people maybe coming out of the space, taking major rate increases, but at the time, like the actual risk itself, it was a black swan event. So it's sort of something you can't really factor into. But at that point, the perception of risk was greater than the risk. And insurance carriers made money within the aviation space. And then once that happens, you have oh, other people start saying, oh, maybe I can make a dollar there too. So you have other entrants into the space and they try to compete with pricing and they'll offer premiums go down, coverage goes up. And eventually you have crappy loss ratios again. And that's what's happening now within that space. This time it's not like the perception of risk isn't greater than the risk itself this time. This time it's really, they're trying to play catch up, I think, with a lot of the losses that have been happening in that space. But you try to take a holistic approach. Is it a line of business you want to be in? Is it something that's going to be valuable? And if yes, yes, it hits all the dots. Then finally, you got the market entry strategy. Well, how do we get comfortable around it? How are we going to rate for this? It's fun stuff. <laughs> it's also very delayed gratification, I would say. So as you are building your firm, what was the gap in the market that you saw that you thought you could exploit? And how have you built your firm around that? I left Pure early 2021 and the broker role kind of came naturally. People were coming to me for advice. And I think there's always been a misalignment of interest in the space where I'm not going to maybe name any specific carriers, but carrier C might be giving 20% commission and charging 20% more for a policy that carrier P is going to charge 20% less, but also pay half the commission. So even though the latter option might be in the insured's best interest, there's a sort of misaligned interest where the broker might sell the former. You get what you pay for is a common fear tactic I've, <laughs> I've heard. And then carriers were also investing a lot in, I don't want to say overstepping the broker, but maybe creating more self-service options, reducing workflows, that sort of thing. But definitely taking on some activities that I think were traditionally like the broker's job, quote unquote. So as I thought about it, there's going to be a big transfer of wealth coming. And I don't know if the traditional broker model, which is at worst a middleman, at best an advisor is going to be enough for that demographic. I think the role of that was changing. So I think there was an opportunity for me to think, well, maybe I could use it for business development purposes now for growing it. But later on, it's also something that's going to align well with the client. Let me try and build something that is a little bit more of a holistic, proactive value add to the client. So when I created my company, LuxXDR, before we even launched, we had a few things in, I guess, R the R&D of things where we wanted to give day one to our client. Insurance is delayed gratification at best. You won't really appreciate it until you need to use it. But as insurance brokers, besides giving a saving here or there, what can we do to help? So we built a few things. I think sort of our scrub, our data scrub, our Google scrub has been quite popular. We've done outpatient therapy networks. We've partnered with a few people on that. So if you're traveling abroad, not for emergency care, but for outpatient services. So having a doctor that's pre-vetted sort of thing. If you're traveling Italy, who maybe has access to your medicine and your prescriptions and that sort of thing, but discounts with private jet operators and charter brokers, just anything we can do that I thought would be valuable to our client. And the data scrub, that's sort of been the most powerful I think kind of both growth and retention tool I probably have right now. That and like coming in as an underwriter, I think that gives you an advantage too. You know where there's 
talking about the perception of risk being greater than the risk before. You're familiar with some of the actuarial assumptions that are happening on the back end, and you're able to guide the conversation in that way. My whole thing was just come in and provide value from day one, real value, real gratification. And you might take it on the chin in terms of margin in year one, but it's something that I'm making the gamble that that's a kind of client that is going to be more likely to refer you and stay with you too. You talked about the role of the broker, and I've seen it both from insurance and other types of brokers where, as you say, they elevate to the role of an advisor. And I think the idea of helping clients understand the risks that are in front of them, the risks that they may not see, and then the risks that they hear about but aren't particularly realistic and helping to, in a sense, triage what they need to worry about and then allocate their premium dollar accordingly. That, to me, is the real value, and that sounds like what you're building with your business. As we stitch toward some of the things we were talking about with data scrubbing, one of the real quiet things that scare me is the cybersecurity issue, where a lot of clients, whether they're in the business or they're dependent on the digital world for their commerce, et cetera, or for those people who aren't dependent on it but can be attacked anyway and have their personal holdings put in jeopardy, that's an area that I think people feel like is out there, but they don't see it until it happens and it's too late. How has your experience applied to cybersecurity so far? I think we as an industry have voted that maybe catastrophe is probably worse than cyber. I don't personally believe that. So when I say catastrophe, it's when you think about like insurance, the biggest problems facing our clients today, it's kind of broken down into three silos. They're not mutually exclusive or anything, but you have like the property and catastrophe side of things. So climate risk and these events that are supposed to be maybe more severe, but less frequent happening with more frequency and that sort of thing, or the cyclicality we alluded to in aviation before. Then you have like the casualty space, which is, I think, pretty contained to the US. We're a pretty litigious society, but there's some cyclicality in that too. Like in the 70s, you had the same social inflation you did then on juries that you do with millennials on juries today, but you've also got like litigation financing and pretty sophisticated targeting certain for returns. Like you have people not just targeting very specific cases, but being really aggressive with what they target. So you've had that. So it's property and catastrophe in one bucket, casualty in another, and then cyber, I think in the last. And with cyber, cyber's like, I think for me, we know so little about it. We know more about catastrophe than we do about cyber, but we haven't really had that cyber 9-11 thing happen yet. And we don't know who the bad guys are. They could be state-sponsored or they could be quacks. <laughs> like You don't know. But there's rapid changes. And that's what's probably the scariest thing about it. It's just we haven't seen this kind of change in exposure from year to year in any other, I think, line of business. Look at like the most toxic toad in the world or frog in the world. And the only animal that's going to be immune to it happens to be within a 25 mile radius of that. So it's sort of like this arms race between cyber professionals that are trying to protect their clients or themselves and the people that are trying to do the attacking. But like best practices today, I don't think it's going to be best practices a year from now or two years from now. Even COVID itself has accelerated some of these things. Everybody being remote, contact information, like I don't know how many texts a week I get about COVID like from somebody claiming to be the government. But so even myself, I take certain precautions, but it's kind of coming at it. And we have a risk. We don't know. We don't know anything about cyber. And as an industry, we've thrown more capital at cyber than we have a cat. So when I'm saying we're voting that cyber is not as bad as cat, that's what I mean. They're saying, OK, we have this capital. What's the best way to deploy it? And we're putting in cyber. For me, that's sort of the scariest thing. Also, like, Property and catastrophe is going to be contained to if you're in the Hamptons, if you're in Florida in certain parts, if you're in wildfire, earthquake territory, it's going to be contained to those regions. Casualties is contained to the U.S. for the most part. We are the like most litigious society. But cyber is a risk everybody's got. And it's something that's quite scary to me. So one of the things we had a joint experience with someone who relies on social media as a tool for their business. Now, this is different from an influencer who is using their following and the social media 
program gets a cut of that or someone who spends advertising to build their brand. This is someone who uses social media as a tool in their business. And then in a sense, they had their tool taken away from them by a bad actor. I'll add on to that the example of, say, Kim Kardashian, who had pictures of her wearing expensive jewelry in Paris, and it became very easy for thieves to find where she was staying and then to break in when she was out and take millions of dollars worth of jewelry. When you look at social media and the public information that is out there with people, and this may align with your data scrubbing capability, how do you help people think about that so that they're reducing their exposure and therefore liability? And what are the insurance companies thinking about on that? Are they kicking out the idea of best practices? Or is this something where, again, we haven't seen that 9-11 of the cyber crime hit yet, and that hasn't been reflected in the business of cybersecurity insurance? I think stories are probably the most powerful way to get people to like the Kim Kardashian thing is a great story just because it resonates with people is all over the news. People don't really understand what their risk is or what a contract covers unless they hear stories. Contracts can be pretty thick stacks. <laughs> so you just kind of want to know if X happens with Y, am I covered for it? So I think insurers have gotten better about providing more substantial coverage in the cyber realm, like a lot, like maybe five years ago, you people were sort of dipping their toes in the water where it was really cosmetic coverage. And now you've gotten it a little bit better and it's still, you have to read between the lines. It's a lot of marketing out there that's pretty misleading with a lot of carriers, but there are some that offer, like HS, Harford Steam Boiler is a good example. They'll cover direct financial loss. So if you actually wired money mistakenly in some kind of transaction, whether it's to an attorney, realtor, like gallery, whatever, they're going to put up what that loss was. So there are some good solutions out there, some real solutions, and they're getting better, I think. Social media is tough. I think my late father used to say there's no such thing as a free lunch. <laughs> if you're using something where you don't have to pay for it, you have to ask yourself, like, if you're the customer or the product, I think social media in that realm factors into it. So the Google kind of like scrubbing someone's personal data from the internet. We do a decent job with it. There's a group called Concentric in Washington. And if you have the funds, they're the most real deal for it. I think everyone else is just cosmetic for the most part, but Concentric, I think they're Washington State, maybe. They're pretty good at it. They do a good job with that sort of thing, but we try to do the scrub, but social media is a very difficult thing to kind of scrub. With Kim Kardashian, like you could look at the door frames and recognize it's a certain hotel or whatever it is, a rapper named Pop Smoke, something similar happened with him within the last two years. So there's that risk. I think there's also the risk of this person, this mutual friend, her Instagram was hacked and held for ransom and she used it for business purposes. And all these companies, despite being kind of pillars of what a startup and mobility and agility, they're quite bureaucratic in their safety and trust departments. So we have relationships with them and we were able, I think what she was working on it for like a month and had to get something notarized, if I remember right. And they were demanding a few thousand dollars to get her account back, all this horrible stuff. And within one week, we took over and handled it and got her account back to her. But it's tough. Best practices are the same best practices you hear all the time, phishing emails. And I think as, again, going back to that arms race kind of analogy, the more uniform best practices become, the less effective they become. So I think when you're specifically, if your listeners are like single and multifamily offices, maybe having like a password, like an oral password, a verbal password you give can be something that's valuable. Anything to make it more difficult, I think, for an outsider. And that's doable. That doesn't cause too much friction. But you're always going to have that dichotomy between friction and security where if you want to be really secure, the process of getting that is going to be maybe not the best user experience. But if you want the best user experience and ease of doing things, it's probably not going to be the most secure either. So that's sort of in my understanding of the tech field. There's an answer in there somewhere. Yeah, you're trying to surf through and find that happy medium between efficiency and security. And if you go all the way to one side or the other, you create as you say, a bad experience. I'd add on to that the lesson from our mutual friend that for someone who's the CEO of a company that sort of wades into the social media waters for whatever purpose, whether it's branding or whether it's as a database or a tool to 
do certain things, it's probably a really good idea to develop one's own relationships, either with a firm like yours who have the contacts with big tech or with people within big tech themselves. Because when you've got to have it fixed, you need an asterisk on the service order because it is a difficult and onerous process to deal with these folks. And they're so big and they service so many people. And whether it's Instagram at a billion people or Google, probably a lot more than that. You're in the world of bots and automation. And sometimes you need to get someone on the other end of the phone. Pretty much impossible. They've spent so much money and so many sophisticated people trying to come up with ways to really make the experience as positive as possible when you're just using it as sort of dopamine receptors and that sort of thing. But when it comes to actual safety issues, they're just like any other. It's like working with the local government. Like It's not a fun process to be in. My whole philosophy, and this is why I think the role of the insurance broker or any risk manager is changing, is because risk itself is changing. We offer the complementary things that we do because, like I said, it might hurt us from a profit margin standpoint, but A, that client's going to be better off. B, they're more likely going to stay with us. C, they're more likely going to refer us to other people. So we try to solve problems. So with our mutual friend, it's not just getting her account back, but maybe going through some best practices before doing it again. And then it's tough. And COVID's made it worse, I think, in an effort to better combat the spread of it and subsequent variants. We've kind of like data piracy is huge. It's become widespread. So our phone numbers are out there. Our emails are out there. We're getting calls, messages like from God knows who and testing sites or other inquiries are always, I would treat them all with caution. If you get random phone numbers, hang out, manage your cookies online. So there's Vivaldi or Brave if you don't have a VPN. Don't use Google Chrome. <laughs> if you do, like there's some extensions you could do. Privacy Badger, Auto Delete. I'm trying to think of other ones. Mozilla was kind of like the original surf the web sort of safely thing, but Chrome has made like the user experience so easy for people. Oh, save my password. Remember my credit card. Like, I think as stakeholders in the process, we kind of have to take a step back and say, well, what's my responsibility to my clients? What's my responsibility to myself, to others in the space? And do I really value my ease of accessing some of these things as much as I value protecting who I need to protect. Well, our mutual friend ended up with a really good outcome. And for that, I know she's very thankful. And I know that watching you work, you create solutions to thorny problems. How do we stay in touch with you? What is the best way to reach out and find out about your firm and to find out about what you're doing and how you help clients navigate risk, both from a cybersecurity standpoint, but from a broader property and casualty perspective? Well, I think people feel free to like email me with any questions, concerns, comments on anything. In my mind, I talk faster, I think, than <laughs> my mouth doesn't really keep up with my mind in some cases. But my email is Ahmet, that's A H M like Matthew, E like Eric, T like Tom, at Lux str.com. That's also our website. It's Lux, L U X dash str like sam thomas robert.com terrific ahmed thank you for coming on it's always great to speak with you and to find out what's happening in that pnc insurance space and we'll be sure to keep touch and thank you for bringing your experience here thank you frazier for having me thank you for listening to this episode of wealth actually hosted by fraser rice author of the book wealth actually and a leading private wealth manager Head on over to WealthActually.com where you can subscribe to this podcast, get your own copy of the Wealth Actually book, and connect with Fraser directly. We'll see you next time on Wealth Actually. Wealth Actually.